Major funding for Hotel Roanoke, the Grand Old Lady on the Hill is provided by the Virginia Tech Foundation, a proud supporter of Blue Ridge PBS and its mission to be the region's storyteller. Additional support is provided by the City of Roanoke and Visit Virginia's Blue Ridge. Welcoming guests to the Roanoke Valley since 1882, the Hotel Roanoke stands elegantly on a gently sloping hill on the north side of the city, just a few steps from the railroad tracks that once carried the steam-powered engines that ultimately and indirectly led to her creation. Her humble beginnings as a dark and rugged 69-room structure would eventually give way to a grand hostelry that has played a prominent part in the social and civic life of the city. Today, the grand old lady is a beautifully appointed modern structure featuring 330 guest rooms, and alongside her, a complimentary companion structure stands, boasting 63,000 square feet of convention, meeting, and event space. Donlan Piedmont wrote in his 1994 book, Peanut Soup and Spoon Bread, an informal history of Hotel Roanoke, that the city and the hotel, virtually founded together, were bound up in an indefinable, almost mystical symbiosis, each drawing nourishment and growth from the other. The words were true then, and they are just as true today. Halfway between Appomattox and the 20th century, Big Lick, Virginia, in 1881, was an unremarkable place. The 1880 census listed 669 persons and about 100 houses, fairly evenly divided between black and white residents. It had just one important business street, unpaved, and punctuated with stepping stones as crossings. Chartered as a town in 1874, Big Lick had a newspaper, the Roanoke Leader, and a railroad, the Atlantic, Mississippi, and Ohio, the ambitiously named and, at the time, virtually bankrupt creature of General William Mahone. This place with the unsophisticated name lay between Hollins College to the north and Roanoke College to the west, even then long-established and highly regarded institutions. Roanoke College and Hollins uh, College, it was Hollins Female Institute at that time, were both established in the 1840s, and so by the time the Hotel Roanoke uh, came into existence in 1882, both of those institutions had been around for 40 years. Great events involving the railroad were in the process of coming to fruition, and the visionaries of Big Lick were quick to see the possibilities. Frederick J. Kimball, president of the Shenandoah Valley Railroad, and himself a world-class visionary, was looking for an appropriate spot for his north-south Shenandoah Railroad to cross the east-west line of the Atlantic, Mississippi, and Ohio. But in 1881, the AM&O went bankrupt and was sold at auction to a group from Philadelphia who also was controlling the Shenandoah Valley. The railroad was renamed to the Norfolk and Western Railroad as opposed to railway. The proposed intersection of the two railroads was hardly confidential. Surveyors were already busy looking at various sites, including Salem, Montvale, Bonsac, and Big Lick. Aware of this and sensing major possibilities for their town, the Big Lick establishment assembled what surely was one of the first industrial development incentive packages, offering land and between five and $10,000 cash to the railroad to locate in Big Lick. A midnight ride was in order. So after that meeting, the town had agreed that they wanted to spend the money and sent out a rider who rode on horseback to Buchanan. A second rider rode from Buchanan to Lexington where the Shenandoah Valley was having a board meeting and convened, pledged their money towards bringing the railroad to Big Lick, and the rest is history. According to Henry Trout, the mayor of Big Lick at the time, the incentive package had a very good effect. Mr. Kimball remarked that the people of Big Lick were alive, and at Big Lick, the Shenandoah would have good friends. With his mind made up, 
Kimball saw immediately that Big Lick couldn't possibly absorb the enormous enterprise he was about to put in place there. Big Lick's eagerness was not enough. What was needed to complement a new and major railroad, general office, and large machine shop complex was a new and major city. The grateful residents of Big Lick wanted to show their appreciation to Kimball, so much so that a June 1881 election ballot listed Kimball and Roanoke as possible names for the forthcoming metropolis. A 57 to 17 vote favored Kimball as the new town name, but Kimball himself quickly rejected the idea by declaring, on the Roanoke River, in Roanoke County, name it Roanoke. Before long, he put the town's new name to an immediate and promising use by creating the Roanoke Land and Improvement Company. Its goal was to develop and build the city and infrastructure needed to shelter and sustain the thousands of workers flocking to Roanoke to share the new prosperity promised by the railroad. The uh, Roanoke Land and Improvement Company was started by the uh, Norfolk and Western Railway officials with the idea that Big Lick, now Roanoke, needed to be developed. I mean, it was kind of, a, just to be honest, a seedy, sleepy little town. And so the Land and Improvement Company that they started acquired ultimately over 1,100 acres in and around the town of Big Lick. Good money was paid for those properties. So a lot of small businessmen in Big Lick slash Roanoke immediately became quite wealthy, literally overnight. By June of 1882, a mill, two office buildings, and 15 stores had been built. The number of blacksmiths, doctors, and lawyers had more than doubled, as had saloons, churches, and houses. The number of hotels increased from three to nine, and one of those nine was the Hotel Roanoke. Kimball himself selected the site in a wheat field on a hill north of the city, just above the railroad tracks. An 1882 photograph of the completed hotel shows it stark and rather bleak. The Queen Anne-styled, half-timber, half-stucco appearance it retained during its entire existence was clearly established, and its architecture featured gables, projections, and porches. The 69 guest rooms available included some of the modern conveniences of the time, such as hot and cold running water, speaking tubes for calling hotel staff, and elevators. The magnificent mountain views from the verandas and every window and door were said to be another amenity. The Hotel Roanoke officially opened its doors on Christmas Day, 1882. The, the main thing about, about Hotel Roanoke's decor is that it was extremely elegant. Remember this railroad town, all these people were coming in to create the, the railroad. Mr. Kimball was the driving force from Philadelphia. He was president of the railroad. It was his taste that influenced the taste of Hotel Roanoke. Patronage grew steadily and for good reason. The hotel was becoming established as more than a place to spend a night. It sought to carve out a niche in the resort market. Norfolk and Western trains entered the city bringing passengers from all points, foreign and domestic. Well-to-do families left the summer heat of the cities in search of the fresh air of the Blue Ridge Mountains. The Hotel Roanoke's first expansion took place in 1891, which added a number of guest rooms and remodeled extensively the hotel's west-facing wing. The timber stucco motif was still evident, and a large wraparound porch built to face both west and south. But just seven years later, in 1898, the hotel's future was in question, when around 1.30 in the afternoon of July the 1st, a fire broke out in the kitchen and quickly spread throughout the wood frame structure. The thick, heavy smoke filled the air, the lawn filled with spectators, and was littered with materials and furnishings. The firemen were having a hard time trying to keep it under control. So the Roanoke machine shop workmen all came running up the hill, and they tried to save carpets and equipment. They did a very good job, but they also lost thousands of dollars worth of furniture and China. What these gentlemen didn't realize was when you throw China and furniture out of second and third floor windows, it's going to break. Several people were seriously injured and only the upper floor and roof were damaged. 
The hotel closed for several months, but by November it was once again open for business. The hotel that sprang from the blackened ruins would be rebuilt numerous times in one form or another over the decades to come. Hotel Roanoke's next expansion took place in 1916. The old east-west wing was torn down and replaced with a new three-story, 72-room addition. Most of the guest rooms were equipped with private baths, and a number of private dining rooms were added as well. The Great Depression was well underway when, in 1931, even the 1916 editions were out of date, thanks to the increasing popularity of automobile travel. Norfolk and Western was willing to spend big money to make its show place more attractive, while simultaneously putting up a new eight-story office building across the street, next door to the existing office building built in 1896. The $225,000 investment added 40,000 square feet of floor space, 75 rooms for a total of 250, and a 60-car garage. New room features included electric fans, movable telephones, and large lighted closets. The most important expansion, however, would take place just six years later, beginning in 1937. The present hotel was torn down and a new hotel was built on the same property, which is what most of us remember the hotel as being before 1995. It's the hotel where you and I are sitting in today. And this hotel comprised six floors plus a penthouse. Budgeted at just over $1 million, the 1937-38 renovation introduced a brand new facade, including the Grand Tudor entrance now facing southwest. The entire west wing was rebuilt and 181 more guest rooms added, bringing the total number of rooms to 310. The new design also included a larger parking garage, a new lobby and reception area, dining room, pine room, writing room, palm court, and a ballroom. It was also the first hotel in the country to be engineered for air conditioning. Now it wasn't air conditioning like we know it today. What they said when they were advertising was that it was there to assist people who had allergies. So that's very different from what we have today. Today we just want cold rooms. <laughs> the lobby, paneled in American black walnut, was furnished for appearance and comfort. The registration desk faced the front door. Above it, a series of murals traced the history of the New World, the Mayflower, Pilgrims and Indians, John Smith and Pocahontas, Patrick Henry, and an old southern plantation. The pine room was paneled in warm, knotty pine and featured traditional prints and a painting of the Roanoke Valley that still hangs there today. The glassed-in porch became Peacock Alley, and the garden site became the Crystal Ballroom. The ballroom would become the heart of the hotel's business and social life as the years rolled on. The dining room was located just about where it was originally, but with a new curved bay facing north. Dogwood, the Virginia State Blossom, was used as the decorative motif and repeated in the design for the new china. To this day, the dogwood china pieces are a much-in-demand souvenir by hotel guests and collectors alike. They're basically five variations of the dogwood pattern itself. It may have been white. It may have gone to a cream color over the years from the 1930s up, all the way up through the 1970s, which was actually used as a thicker china, to the more elegant, closer to bone china that was used till the original closing, and then what they use today. So people would come to Roanoke just to go and buy one of the plates to say that they had been to the Hotel Roanoke. A September 1938 menu listed breakfast prices ranging from 35 to 75 cents luncheon from 60 to 90 cents, and dinner from $1.10 to $1.50. Rates for the rooms in the new wing began at $3, and in the east wing, at $2.50. With unveiling of the new west wing in 1938, Hotel Roanoke entered the modern age, its location ideal, its reputation immaculate and growing, with excellent service still at the heart of the grand old lady on the hill. 
In June 1942, Deacon Brown, assistant head waiter, celebrated 60 years of service with the hotel. Not far behind was William Campbell, who in 1948 celebrated his 45th anniversary. Like Deacon Brown, Campbell too sent all of his children to college, four sons and two daughters, and like him, enjoyed seeing his photograph on the front of a congratulatory menu. For many, service was a career and practically a lifetime commitment to the grand old lady. Another very committed member of the hotel team in those days was Fred Brown, because in 1940, Chef Brown invented Hotel Roanoke's signature peanut soup. Favorable reaction was immediate, and for a time, the recipe in which peanut butter was the main ingredient was a closely guarded secret. But after hundreds of requests every year, the recipe finally got printed and hasn't been much of a secret since. It's safe to say that many chefs since the days of Chef Brown have tried to add their own twist to the famous peanut soup, and many will try again. Obviously, I came down here to interview. Uh, I was having dinner with uh, our human resources director. So, you know, so when I see the peanut soup, and of course me being a chef, I'm like, okay, how can I tweak this? How can I fancy this up? How can I, how can I put my twist on it? She's like, oh, no, no, no. You know, we don't touch a peanut soup recipe. That's an heirloom recipe, That's that we don't touch that. I'm like, yeah, but what if we did like a jelly crouton and it was a peanut butter jelly soup and so on? And she's like, oh no, 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 the peanut soup is a peanut soup. I'm like, okay. As for the spoon bread, this savory dish isn't a bread at all. It's, just, it's like a custard, like cornmeal custard. It's creamy, it's eggs and butter and cornmeal. And where can you go wrong with that? And it, again, people will come in and be like, you got spoon bread today? I'm like, of course we do. We serve our spoon bread seven days a week. And if we don't have it, you'll see me outside with an angry mob. By the mid 40s, the nation was deep in the throes of the Second World War. And the hotel did its part, temporarily housing Army, Air Force, and Navy pilots taking classwork and flight instruction at Roanoke's Woodrum Field. Well, the amazing thing is that uh, World War II had a tremendous impact up upon Roanoke in that our airport was a national defense project. And so there was a very large military presence uh, here in the Roanoke Valley because of that. At Roanoke College, we had the Naval Aviation Cadet Training Program, both a ground school and a flight school. But yeah, there was a, just a tremendous amount of military personnel here during World War II. Officers and their families were housed in the South Wing and fed in the Regency Room as residents. For their relaxation, the government took over the Pine Room to serve as an officers' club. In its own way, the officers' club contributed to Roanoke's social life. After the war, the officers and the Pine Room all returned to civilian life. The war had barely ended when in September 1945, Norfolk and Western announced another million dollar facelift. This project involved mainly the replacement of the four-story wing parallel to the railroad tracks, the South Wing, with one of five stories. New guest rooms raised the total to 361. With the 1946-47 work, Hotel Roanoke became completely air-conditioned. Unlike the 1938 claim that the hotel was scientifically designed for air conditioning, it seems clear that being designed for cooling and actually being cooled were two different things. There was only one more major construction project undertaken before the hotel closed in 1989. A new five-story and basement north wing was constructed parallel to Jefferson Street in 1955 primarily to accommodate increasing demand for larger convention facilities. Hotel management clearly felt that while guests and their families would always be welcome and pampered by its trademark service and hospitality, the nation's changing business practices had created a booming convention trade. Meetings and conventions have been part of the Hotel Roanoke's business model since the very early days. The aim then to put guests in the rooms and diners at the tables was the same in 1952. In the thriving post-war business climate, the hotel produced and widely distributed a film called Hospitality Unlimited. It was aimed at the convention market and showed off the hotel and its many guest services, although sometimes exaggerating the storyline to do so. 
the beautiful, completely air-conditioned Hotel Roanoke. Hospitality Unlimited, with its dated charm, features hotel guests arriving on a passenger train hauled by a Norfolk and Western Class J engine. The women detrain wearing hats, gloves, and furs. Bellmen escort the guests to their rooms and point out the new amenities, like air conditioning and the individually wrapped drinking glasses. When the guests order dinner, the film features the exclusive dogwood pattern china, even a machine that manufactures ice never touched by human hands. While the business meetings are taking place, the women are manicured in the beauty shop, play bridge in the pine room, and write postcards to friends and family back home. Some of the men, possibly skipping the business session, are in the barbershop or in the health club. One, in shirt and tie no less, is working out on a stationary bicycle. Another, presumably not wearing a shirt and tie, is in the steam bath. And a third is getting a rub down. Feeling like a million. The second film, produced in 1963, shows off new facilities and amenities, including TV sets in each room and telephone message lights, an exhibit hall designed to handle large displays, the motor inn, and a new swimming pool. In opening the motor inn in 1963, a hotel tried to follow a national trend. Hotels were losing business to the new booming motel industry and so started calling themselves motor hotels or motor inns in an effort to appeal to the automobile traveler. And they had a certain number of rooms set aside. They had parking right outside. They suddenly realized that they needed three shifts a day to handle this with very little business. It lasted a very short time. It just could not compete with places on the highway. Changes and improvements, steady and costly, continued through the 1960s and beyond in order to make the hotel, along with its ambiance, cuisine, and other amenities more attractive to meeting and wedding planners alike. The Hotel Roanoke has always been in very high demand for ceremonies, receptions, and family gatherings. This was a special place for my parents because this was, they had their first date here and then their wedding reception. It was the site of many, many uh, family occasions and special dinners out. And when we would come to the hotel for dinner, we would have to, you know, for several nights leading up to it, have to practice our Hotel Roanoke manners. <laughs> I was five years old. It was a, a wonderful place to learn about manners because for one thing, you dressed up for dinner. You came into a formal setting, the table was set very nicely, and you sat down, put your napkin in your lap, and you had to learn which fork to use and which, when to use your knife. And it was a wonderful place to, to experience something very special and formal. There were so many weddings during his time at the hotel that Billy Davis was known to say that he had handled so many weddings and receptions in his job as assistant banquet manager that he could virtually cry on request. And yet, with all of that, there was once even a funeral at the hotel. Clearly not as joyful an occasion as the weddings, it nevertheless reflected the familial and personal hold the hotel had on its guests. Like the former Roanoke music teacher who'd retired and moved to Florida, Every year, she'd return to Roanoke and spend several weeks of the summer at the hotel. She had said that she hoped when she died, her ashes could be scattered on the hotel flower beds. So when the time came, her family gave a luncheon here at the hotel, after which her friends stood on the porch and watched as the family walked down and scattered her ashes among the flower beds. Um, it just showed that there were people who, once they came to the hotel, really had a hard time leaving. Celebrating and grieving families aside, Hotel Roanoke had many supporters in its steady efforts to fill the rooms. One, of course, was the railroad itself. The Norfolk and Western's board of directors met at the hotel regularly, and the company's principal and largest gathering for many years was the annual Better Service Conference, Another major source of business was the Miss Virginia organization. In 1953, the Junior Women's Club uh, 
was the, the first group to, to have that back in 1953. And the first pageants were held right here in Hotel Roanoke in the old Crystal Ballroom. And uh, so uh, the love relationship between the Miss Virginia pageant and Hotel Roanoke started a long time ago. Hotel Roanoke, until recently, remained the headquarters for the contestants. Each new Miss Virginia had the use of a suite in the hotel for the year of her reign. Kylene Barker, Miss Virginia! Kylene Barker, the first Miss Virginia to become Miss America in 1978, was given further special treatment by the hotel. And so I came back to Southwest Virginia, uh, to Pulaski County, my hometown of Galax, and of course stayed here at the Hotel Roanoke because it was the home of Miss Virginia. So they didn't tell me this and it was such an incredible surprise, but I checked in and they led me down the hall <laughs> and they had remodeled a, a whole suite for me and it was called the Miss America Suite. So anytime I came back into this area and stayed at Hotel Roanoke, I got to stay in my own suite, the Miss America Suite. By 1985, Hotel Roanoke was struggling. John Fishwick, although retired as Norfolk and Western's chairman, was asked by Top Brass to return to Roanoke and oversee the hotel operations and to determine what, if anything, could be done with the property, which had been losing money. Annual losses frequently approached the $1 million mark. Fishwick's first priority was to find the right person to lead the hotel toward a more successful and profitable future. He found Doreen Hamilton, whose forte was cost-cutting and tight, accurate budgeting. I um, was asked to come and look at the hotel. I had no intention of leaving the North. I, I was uh, managing director of a hotel in Philadelphia. And finally, I decided I would come and look at it. So I met a Mr. Fishwick and I looked the hotel over, and they were very kind to me because they let me look at the books and uh, they opened up everything to me. On January 1st, 1986, Hamilton became the new general manager of the Hotel Roanoke. The workforce she was to manage was still shaken from a six month long strike a few years earlier. They were striking against working conditions and wages. The declining occupancy in the hotel had made it impossible to keep all the full-time employees, and they had to keep wage increases at a minimum. The strike went on for six months, and it ended in April 1984, after a settlement was reached. The employees, I think, suffered badly um, as you do in any strike, but the hotel also suffered badly. But Hamilton was quick to put those matters aside for the time being and concentrated her efforts on the finances. Aside from collecting unpaid debts, the hotel needed work. Rooms were redecorated. The Regency room was updated. Hamilton also managed to negotiate a new contract for employees, so morale was on the upswing. Things were looking good for the hotel. And before we knew it, we had business. In 1987 and 1988, we spent over a million dollars in decorating and taking care of the hotel. And all of that money was generated from the internal cash flow of the hotel. So we had turned a corner, but we weren't sure how long that would last. At the same time, such earnings as the hotel was generating clearly were not enough to finance a major capital expenditure, the $35 million needed for a new heating and cooling system, the principal source of guest complaints, a system that had been installed in 1937. Our supply of steam that was coming for the heat came from the railroad underground to this hotel, and it wasn't adequate and we keep calling for more and more steam. And even though we were paying for it, it wasn't enough. So we knew that we were going to have to do something. There was no way we could generate that kind of cash. Norfolk and Western, now Norfolk Southern, following a merger in 1982, had no plans to invest tens of millions of dollars into a hotel. 
Norfolk Southern by the late 80s was a much larger, far different railroad than the Norfolk and Western that I came to work for in 1965. Things had changed a lot. The hotel, of course, was still an icon and an important uh, factor in Roanoke and an important uh, thing for the, for the railroad because it was a symbol and, uh, and, and an identification. While it was a nice holding, the Hotel Roanoke was not large enough, nor was it part of the core operations of a, of, of a large uh, railroad transportation company. So the idea was that uh, the, the hotel was really a management distraction. Norfolk Southern wanted out of the hotel business, and the Hotel Roanoke was on the chopping block. Well, when I heard the news that uh, the hotel uh, in particular, the railroad had made a decision not to invest any more money in the hotel and that they were going to go through perhaps a year-long process to uh, close the hotel. Um, my initial concern really was about how it might affect the downtown uh, area being immediately adjacent and what it would do to the general well-being of the, of the community. But Roanoke residents would have none of it. And behind the scenes, Roanokers pleaded with city council to find a way to save the hotel. Council members placed that burden on the city manager. And slowly came back uh, to me over a matter of months and said, Bob, we've just lost too many icons in Roanoke, too many important buildings, and the public really has genuine interest in seeing that this uh, project um, not close. Uh, and that if anybody is going to try and develop the property, we want you to explore uh, on behalf of city government uh, the development of the property. So that's really how I got uh, involved. Simultaneously, the city was in desperate need of a large, modern, state-of-the-art conference center if it was to compete with larger convention cities. Several studies were conducted, and it was determined that Roanoke could support such a facility if there was a larger, more modern hotel to support it. Modern being the operative word, which at that time would eliminate the Hotel Roanoke as she then stood. It was definitely tired and needed renovation. Uh, you would find uh, amenities that did not match that of other facilities. It was very outdated. By the late 1980s, Virginia Tech's incoming president, Dr. James McComas, was wrapping up his stint as president of the University of Toledo. He had not yet left one for the other. Warner Dahlhouse, CEO at Dominion Bank Shares, was eager to add McComas to his board of directors. Dahlhouse and his vice chairman, David Caudell, flew to Toledo to make the offer and as a courtesy invited Roanoke Mayor Noel Taylor and city manager Herbert to go along. Caudell and Herbert saw the trip as a chance to explore the new president's interest in the hotel conference center issue. We wanted to convey to him the, uh, the total value of this hotel and its uh, proximity to Blacksburg and its importance to Western Virginia, both the Roanoke Valley and the New River Valley. He grasped that very quickly. In fact, the overall concept was to persuade him that it was essential to Virginia Tech's future that Tech and the Roanoke Valley be wed uh, and work very closely together. And he, he grasped that right away. Herbert reminded McComas of Virginia Tech's mission as a land-grant university, the Commonwealth as a campus, continuing education and outreach. McComas had no need of the sales pitch, however. His own University of Toledo had earlier become involved in a similar role with the city and an existing hotel. And excitedly, he talked about a project that he had with General Motors and the University of Toledo to do education programming, saving two older kind of high-rise Holiday Inn type uh, icons, not historically important as, as the Hotel Roanoke, begins to explain the role that the university plays in re-educating uh, GM workers who are moving from the old automobiles and educating in how to put and work with computers in the new cars. 
He was able to show the Roanokers how old hotel properties had been converted to serve as education and training facilities. And Jim, after the visit uh, from the individuals here in Roanoke, called and asked me to come to Toledo uh, to help prepare him for his transition to Virginia Tech. But Jim said, Menace, I'd like for you to give some real serious thought to this, to work with the folks in Roanoke and see if there's a possibility that we could establish a relationship, especially in view of the fact that you've shared with me that the university has been thinking of establishing a new conferencing presence. With McComas now in place in Blacksburg, the university was prepared to move ahead. I started meeting with the individuals here in Roanoke, made it very clear that if we were to do this, it would be a conferencing center where we would expand our focus in conferencing, which means basically non-credit education and ties in with good quality at higher education. Thinking along the same lines was Norfolk Southern's man in the hotel, John Fishwick. Though primarily representing Norfolk Southern's interest, he wanted to find a way to fill the need for a major meeting facility, settle the hotel dilemma, and at the same time promote Tech's own goals. On his own and without any backing or authorization from Norfolk Southern, Fishwick asked if Virginia Tech would consider accepting the hotel as a gift. On July 26, 1989, Arnold B. McKinnon, chairman of the board and CEO of Norfolk Southern Corporation, alongside Dr. James McComas, president of Virginia Tech, and Roanoke City Mayor Noel C. Taylor held a press conference in the hotel's Pine Room. Norfolk Southern Corporation would donate its 107-year-old Hotel Roanoke to Virginia Tech to be turned into a major facility for conferences and continuing education. A sad end and a brave beginning for the Hotel Roanoke. Five months later, Doreen Hamilton, now Mrs. John Fishwick, found herself operating the Hotel Roanoke while simultaneously preparing to shut it down on November the 30th, 1989. Well, there were a lot of to-do lists. Firstly, we had to cancel all the reservations that we had on the books after the closing. We had to notify those people that we would not be around. Along with many pressing matters, there was the question of a financial settlement for employees. Second, third, and fourth generations worked at the hotel, and there were no provisions for severance pay. Fishwick felt strongly that the employees deserved better. And before long, Norfolk Southern and the employees union reached a deal. Business continued as usual. They assured me that the employees would continue to run the hotel for the last four months as they always had in the past, right up until the last order was taken for food and the last drink order was taken. That matter settled, it was determined that the hotel's closing would best be marked with a spectacular invitation-only closing banquet in the Crystal Ballroom. The event was held November 28, 1989 and attendance was limited by space to 600 for a dinner and dance. The event became a hot ticket, prized by those who had one and coveted by those who didn't. After dinner, Fishwick proposed a toast to the hotel's past. To the Hotel Roanoke. May, may she, she sleep, sleep well. well. And may she waken with all the charm of today to face a bright and prosperous 21st century. The hotel room. And then, in a moment that brought tears to most, guests and staff hugged one another amid sobs and tears. As the day darkened and the air cooled, guests moved outside for the final ceremony of the evening. Doreen Fishwick gave one last speech, followed by moving remarks by the Reverend Noel Taylor. The Hotel Roanoke, he said, has become a symbol to us all. Our citizens cherish its beauty and hold dear the memories of good times. But as we close its doors, lower the flags, and sing the final notes, we also open the door to the future of our city. 
but it was almost like a funeral. People from Roanoke came and stood in that circle, um, not knowing if it would ever be opened again. So at midnight, the door was locked and the hill became dark and hushed. And that was the end. When the Hotel Roanoke doors reopened at 9 on the Monday morning following the closing banquet on December 4th, waiting in the cold was a line of people stretching around the building. There was to be an everything goes liquidation sale with tens of thousands of pieces there for the picking. From coffee spoons to laundry equipment, beds to bath towels, televisions to teacups. And there are stacks and stacks of china and there are piles of linens and piles of furniture and piles of items that came throughout the rooms. Everything to the actual uniforms uh, of the individuals that were there. And to know that less than a week before that I was here and somebody was wearing that outfit. That was somebody's job. That was somebody's livelihood. It's gone. And, and yes, it was a very, very solemn uh, event. It was like people going to awake. It was a terribly emotional situation because you just hated to see the grand old lady being torn apart by souvenir hunters. It's like somewhat like vultures picking over the carcass here with things stacked up to be sold. It just was tragic. It didn't look very much like a war zone. There was China broken. There were things knocked over. It looked horrible. In the Crystal Ballroom, where sales were rather robust, oddly enough, there were only 48 cups and saucers to be found, and no water goblets at all with the HR logo, a shortage likely explained by guests who had been eager for a keepsake with which to remember the grand old lady. By the beginning of October, we had to order more china and silverware to carry on our business for the next two months. <laughs> I can see people getting a piece of silverware into their pocket, but our silverware wasn't stamped with anything. It was just regular silverware. Um, I don't know how they could possibly have gotten a plate or a sugar bowl or a cream pitcher unless they bought great big bags. And we certainly didn't inspect them because we didn't expect this to happen. But anyway, some people have really nice souvenirs. The remaining staff moved across the street to the Norfolk and Western building to wrap up remaining financial matters. In the hotel, the lights and heat were turned off. The staff departed. Everything that had given life and warmth, flavor and style to the Hotel Roanoke was gone. The building was left alone, silent and dark. But was it dead? By the early 90s, there was an all-star cast of players, too many to mention, all of whom played an integral part in what would follow. My recollection is that when the hotel closed, it was still in doubt as to whether a viable plan could be put together uh, to, to reopen it. There, there were certainly conversations and negotiations in progress, but a plan had not been agreed to by the city and by Virginia Tech. Prior to the hotel closure and behind the scenes, much discussion was taking place regarding need for a much larger state-of-the-art conference facility. That is, if the city wanted to compete for convention business. First thing you knew was that Roanoke had been losing convention business to the other parts of the state because we didn't have a large enough convention center and multiple rooms. I think there was a lot of chatter on the city side of what we could do to improve that. Um, and so that kind of conversation was happening in, in one world, and then the, the Hotel Roanoke being gifted to Virginia Tech happened at the same time. Meanwhile, the city was losing the little bit of convention business it had already generated due to the hotel's closure. Local meeting planners and tourism personnel feared the worst. When we were told that the Hotel Roanoke was going to go offline and we didn't know when it was going to come back, we were concerned because this was the largest facility and to take it off of our inventory was going to, to change the dynamics of what was available to meetings and conferences across the state and to continue to be viable. And when you book with groups, you book 
two to three years out sometimes. And a lot of that was lost and the revenue was lost. By the early 90s and many meetings, discussions and studies later, a plan finally was put in place. And so was the partnership that would bring the project to fruition. The city of Roanoke and Virginia Tech would work together to reopen the hotel. But there were some challenges to overcome. We determined along with the city that simply keeping the hotel open was not an option if we were to maintain its viability. That the hotel uh, was an old building. It needed substantial renovation and updating and conferencing facilities would have to be built alongside the hotel. And uh, analyzing that, it was determined that this entire plan would cost somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to $45 million. The financial backing needed to complete such a project was substantial. And to make things worse, a recession had a tight grip on the national economy. The risk was high and no single bank would agree to finance the project. Ultimately, several entities did step up and invest in the project, including the Virginia Tech Foundation, Doubletree Corporation, plus a number of financial institutions and state agencies. Yet by late fall of 1992, the financing effort was coming up short, and the added pressure of a December 31st deadline was making things difficult. Time was running out. Well, there, there was a timing constraint at that time. You know, Virginia Tech basically set a date and said, look, we've got we to pull this off by this date or we've got a problem. And we certainly didn't want to have to turn the hotel back over to the railroad to, to an unknown future. Things were not looking good for the grand old lady. Every entity gave or loaned what it could. Every possibility had been exhausted. It came down to a shortage of roughly $6 million. And at that time, Tom Robertson, who was the um, executive officer and the president over at uh, Korean Healthcare System, stepped in and said, OK, uh, let's see if the community really wants to see this project done. And so they put together Renew Roanoke. The Renew Roanoke campaign was a seven-week fundraising attempt born out of desperation. In an unprecedented last-ditch effort over the Christmas holiday, the entire community took up the challenge and the goal was reached. We actually had telephones and tremendous publicity reaching out to the people of Western Virginia, all of Virginia, and saying, we want to save the Hotel Roanoke. Uh, we put all the money we can find into this project, uh, but we're, we need a little bit of more help. At a rally at the Roanoke Civic Center on January 11, 1993, Tom Robertson announced that Renew Roanoke had raised $5 million. In addition, Norfolk Southern donated another $2 million. The Hotel Roanoke would survive. The Hotel Roanoke and Conference Center formally reopened in April of 1995. A ribbon cutting and dedication ceremony marked the successful culmination of efforts by Civic, education, business, and philanthropic leaders throughout the Roanoke and New River Valleys. So I think it's one of the great success stories. And what it shows, in my opinion, is cities and some individual entities can't always do things by themselves. But this is a prime example of a partnership that allowed something really significant to happen to Roanoke that would have never happened otherwise. Gary Walton was hired to oversee the reopening and manage a new and more modern Hotel Roanoke, including a 63,000 square foot conference center. From behind the scenes, it was very much apparent that we had you know, two, basically running two organizations, two businesses, but we really wanted the experience for our guests to be a seamless one, so they didn't know that. It was a pretty uh, significant educational uh, process. Uh, to explain to people how we would operate uh, and how we would target our business. The new Hotel Roanoke would now have a number of resources that the original hotel did not. One, one of the most important decisions that was made at the time of reopening was to affiliate the hotel with a national hotel chain 
to ensure success and help with the national marketing, reservation systems, frequent guest programs, and uh, currently we're with Hilton. Uh, we're a curio by Hilton, and that's been fantastic for us. It's really allowed us to lift quality, uh, and with the investments, it's, it's really paying dividends. The renovation and construction project was, and is to this day, a true public-private partnership. Ownership of the property now falls to two separate entities, both equally important, but each with its own revenue, budget, and capital needs. The Conference Center of Roanoke is owned by the Hotel Roanoke Conference Center Commission. Okay? The Hotel Roanoke is owned by Virginia Tech Foundations. Although you hopefully would never see a line of demarcation here, you would see it as a constant flow of one property, there is in essence a physical conference center and a physical hotel. And we marry up where we marry up. But the idea was to create, you know, obviously one flowing experience for guests and groups. Additional structure and infrastructure projects were undertaken at the time of construction. The realignment of Wells Avenue serves as a major gateway to Roanoke from the interstate and local traffic. Reconstruction of 2nd Street and the 2nd Street Bridge allows for better traffic circulation to downtown and the conference center. The Market Square walkway was another necessary addition and it too has benefited downtown businesses and attractions. Yeah, that, that's a huge deal. Um, today you can come out of the hotel and you can actually walk over the railroad tracks instead of having to cross the railroad tracks. Um, and it's just so easy to get between the hotel and downtown and you're immediately in proximity to the art museum, all of the restaurants and the galleries. And that's especially important when conferences are here. So many people want to experience the neighborhood. They just don't want to come into the hotel and sit and have a meeting, but they want to experience what the neighborhood has to offer. The city that once struggled to attain and retain meeting and convention business due to a lack of space is now able to position itself as a state-of-the-art convention destination. The Hotel Rona Conference Center plays an essential role when it comes to bringing in the new economy, uh, whether it be the medical industry, uh, whether it be high tech, conference and, and meetings business has just really gone through the roof. We are uh, enjoying eight consecutive record years of growth now, and it acts as a great attractor for bringing in the meetings that this community needs to move the economy forward. Another important partnership announced in 2007 between Virginia Tech and Carilion Clinic has had a direct impact on the hotel and conference center. The Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine and Research Institute relies heavily on the downtown property. So the relationship between Hotel Roanoke and Carilion Clinic is really rather intimate. It's such an important asset to have that partnership it's one we rely on because we want a wonderful place when we're recruiting uh, new talent and we use this facility often. We also need the conference center facility uh, for a lot of the conferences, a lot of the work that we do to educate our staff, our managers, our board, and so it, it's really rather important to us. Virginia Tech is a very engaged university. We're, as a land-grant university, we were created to be engaged with, a, with a, the people that we, that we serve, which is really the whole Commonwealth. So having a conference center attached to the hotel has been a, a huge boon to uh, our engagement for this community, not only for um, events and, and celebrations, but also for educational opportunities, for holding uh, workshops, symposia, conferences. So we view it as not only uh, an asset for, as a hotel and a conference center, but as a way of extending the reach of Virginia Tech into this community. The Hotel Roanoke that opened in 1995 clearly is a very different structure than the Hotel Roanoke that opened in 1882. The Tudor characteristic she was born with still apparent in the current version of the Old English Inn. Another long-standing tradition that is still evident to this day is that of excellent service and hospitality, thanks to the dedicated workers who have served the grand old lady all these years. Service is invaluable here, and from a position of a mayor, it's important to us because they're oftentimes the first people that are seen uh, when people come into our city. Pulling up in the valet parking and the way you're treated coming in, doors are open for you. They welcome you to come in. 
So the service is what it's all about, and it's friendly service. Like Deacon Brown and William Campbell in the 1940s, and countless others who provided service throughout the last century and a half, today's Hotel Roanoke employees remain committed to making a difference for the guests they serve. Well, I always say if I can make somebody else smile, I'm going to smile along with them. So I try to give people my best each and every day. And customer service is very important, especially if you want the people to come back. And I prefer to make them feel at home when they're away from home. Well, I've been in the service industry for when I was 13 years old, I started. And I've always seen the hotel standing on a hill and I'm, when I worked at the Shenandoah Club. And I seen the hotel right up and I said, you know, one day I'm going to work there. And then when I walked in the first day, I actually got the job. I said, this is where I'm going to stay. And the service here is outstanding. People come back time and time again. And I always make sure they leave with a smile. For many at the hotel, both in the past and the present, employment at the Grand Old Lady has been a family affair. It's been a wonderful uh, place of employment uh, throughout the years here at the hotel. Uh, we've got currently uh, pairs of employees who are related, uh, either moms and daughters, fathers and sons, cousins and aunts, and the commitment that they show and what it means to their family through the years really is pretty incredible to see. Well, my grandmother worked here first, and then I think my mother wanted to find out what it was like, and then she followed in my grandmother's shoes, and my aunts, they followed in my mother's shoes. And then after my mother passed, I was wondering what was the big deal, so I followed in her shoes, so I came. I really enjoyed it. It was just a great place. Well, it started off with my father and my mother's father. And my dad put in 42 years. My mom put in, I think, 20 years off and on. Her aunt worked here, and I think she did maybe a year or two. What would Frederick Kimball think of his railroad hotel as it stands today, still overlooking the city he helped establish? His railroad may largely have left the city, but its influence remains. From his vision and the vision of Roanoke and Virginia Tech leaders who were in the right place at the right time, a partnership has evolved and grown to strengthen the communities around them. Well, as, as being Virginia's senior land-grant university, okay, it is core to our values okay, and to our core mission that we indeed find ways in which we can deliver okay, the discoveries that come out of our classrooms and, and laboratories for the economic benefit of the people of the Commonwealth of Virginia and really the, uh, the people of the country and the world. And so this, this facility has provided prime venue for us to be able to deliver these types of cutting edge technology-based educational programs that indeed benefit the, the businesses and communities and the, and the private sector, the government. And so we are very proud, again, of what has taken place at this uh, wonderful venue. This grand old lady has been through much since she first opened her doors all those years ago, but never has she looked as resilient and elegant as she does today. And at her side, her sturdy companion, the Conference Center, leads those who walk through its doors to their bright and successful future. Major funding for Hotel Roanoke, the Grand Old Lady on the Hill is provided by the Virginia Tech Foundation, a proud supporter of Blue Ridge PBS and its mission to be the region's storyteller. Additional support is provided by the City of Roanoke and Visit Virginia's Blue Ridge.